Welcome to everybody. Um, it's a particular pleasure for me to introduce this evening my friend and colleague Brian Hurwitz, who's going to give us a talk to accompany this magnificent exhibition, which um, Brian organized alongside Brandon High and Katie Sambrook, um, and which will run until December the 16th. And um, Brian is the doily Cart Professor of Medicine and the Arts here at King's. Um, he's also a phenomen when it comes to um, anything connected with Parkinson and his world. No one knows more about it than Brian. <laughs> Um, I can assure you we're in for a real treat this evening. Um, this is the fruit of many years' labor. Um, the format of this evening will be that Brian will talk um, for about three quarters of an hour. There'll then be a chance to ask questions, make comments, and um, you can then also have a look at this magnificent exhibition um, of Parkinsoniana. And um, we hope you'll join us for a drink afterwards downstairs. Um, we'll um, guide you there. So uh, please join me in welcoming Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that introduction, Neil. Um, my talk will focus on what today is considered James Parkinson's most significant work his essay on the shaking palsy. It's the centerpiece of this exhibition, curated by Brandon High from Special Collections and myself to mark the 200th anniversary of its publication. And I'm very grateful to the staff of Special Collections at King's who've assisted in every way in putting the exhibition together. The essay reformulated an array of disorders of human movements as a single disease drawing on indoor and outdoor observations in clinical and urban case descriptions, Parkinson characterized particular types of shaking and disorders of posture and gait, and fused them together in an affecting generic account. I'll outline the essay and consider how he came to redefine what was then a little known medical condition. As Soon as the essay appeared, it gained wide notice the work was summarized in the London Medical and Physical Journal and approvingly reviewed in other journals in 1817. It was praised by John Cook, physician to the London Hospital, in his Treatise on Nervous Diseases of 1820 and quoted verbatim and unacknowledged in Thomas Graham's Modern Domestic Medicine in 1827, which spoke directly to the public. It was cited in The Lancet by John Elliotson of St. Thomas's Hospital in 1830, Marshall Hall of the Webb Street uh, Anatomy Theatre in Southwark in 1838, and by the Scottish physician William Sanders in the Edinburgh Medical Journal of 1865, who was the first person to coin the term Parkinson's disease. And it was referred to in detail by a host of international neurological authorities, including the German physician Marshal Romberg in 1846, the French physicians Armand Trousseau and J.M. Charcot in the 1860s, and by William Gowers at Queen's Square in London in the 1870s. Many of these clinicians treated the condition in depth, adding to and subtracting from the clinical picture set out in the essay. Despite this acclaim, compared with some of Parkinson's other works, which in his lifetime notched up multiple reprintings, his chemical pocketbook four and domestic medicine five editions, the essay remained hard to get hold of throughout the whole of the 19th century and was not reprinted until well into the 20th. With some 15 or so original volumes surviving worldwide, we are very fortunate to have a copy of a first edition on loan from the Royal College of Surgeons of which Parkinson was a member. In the preface, Parkinson wrote, the disease is highly afflictive, notwithstanding which it has not yet obtained a place in the classification of nosologists, people who classify diseases. Some have regarded its characteristic symptoms as distinct and different diseases. Others have given its name to diseases differing essentially from it. Whilst the unhappy sufferer has considered it as an evil 
from the domination of which he had no prospect of escape, unquote. Given the severity of the malady, it surprised him that it remained hardly recognized. In the preface, he alerted readers to a terminological entanglement that arose from some of its symptoms having been described previously but understood differently, whilst the term shaking palsy had been deployed both in the vernacular and medical discourse actually for hundreds of years going back to the 16th century to designate conditions quite different from that identified in the essay. The disease is of long duration, he continued, to connect, therefore, the symptoms which occur in its later stages with those which mark its commencement requires a continuance of observation even for years." Unquote. As we will see, the essay encompasses momentary street noticings and periods of clinical observation spanning over a decade. But before we consider his act of synthesis, which I think the essay is, in more detail, let me say a few words about its author. James Parkinson was born on April 11th, 1755, April the 11th now being World Parkinson's Day. He was born at 1 Hoxton Square, Shoreditch, then a semi-rural village just beyond the reaches of the city of London. The second of four generations of apothecaries who worked from the same premises, the Parkinson household stood on the southwestern corner with a view across the square. It was surrounded by orchards and market gardens with open fields and farms to the north. A 1778 history of the parish describing it as, quote, pleasantly situated of a figure of a parallelogram whose area is above an acre and a half, the residence of nonconformists and other divines, unquote. And this is a map of um, 1792, so when Parkinson was about 36, 37, and you can see um, this is Hoxton Square, which was actually laid out in the 17th century. Um, number one is where Parkinson lived, just on the corner here. This is Hoxton Market, and you can see the amount of land uh, and the farms uh, that are dotted all around, Hemlock Barn in the far north. So that's 1792, the directory map. But if you look at the map of, part of this area when Parkinson died in the 1820s, you can see how urbanized it, it had already become. And in fact, the whole area was really a massive building site for 150 years as Hoxton and Shoreditch and Bethnal Green uh, grew up in uh, density. Here again is Hoxton Square. Uh, there's the marketplace. Um, this is St. Leonard's Church, which is a big interchange um, between the Kingston Road, Old Street Road, and um, the, the Hackney Road. So it's a very important interchange. It's a medieval church, although it was rebuilt, in the, rebuilt on a number of occasions, but rebuilt in the 18th century. And the, uh, the, the picture I showed at the beginning um, was uh, of the rebuild of the church, the intersection, Interestingly, there's actually a surgeon apothecary shop on the corner there. It's not Parkinson's residence, but it just gives you a feel for the locality. This is a steel engraving of 1800. And also an interest, just a sense of the different postures, the different gates, the stoops, um, uh, the lugging, the pulling that you see in this uh, area. James, as I say, was the first child of John and Mary Parkinson who went on to have two more children. And at the age of 16, James became apprenticed to his father. And at 21, still within the period of his apprenticeship, he attended the London Hospital for six months as dresser to the senior surgeon. And just to give you a sense of the rurality of the area, this is the London Hospital soon after it was built in the 1750s, and you can see it's completely surrounded by fields. It's almost certainly a, an idealization, but it just gives you a feel for how extraordinarily rural the area was. This is actually the, the, the Mount Rubbish Dump that was well known in the area. Here you've got St George's in the east, and here you've got uh, uh, Limehouse. The, the, the church. So the big landmarks are there, and you can see uh, the, the, the evocation of morality with the, uh, with the cattle and the haymaking, uh, etc. James at the London also came under the influence of a younger surgeon, William Blizzard, who in his younger days 
under the pseudonym of Curtius, condemned abuses of parliamentary power. And actually, Parkinson remained in touch with Blizzard all his life, referring patients to him, sometimes Blizzard coming out and seeing patients in their own home. Blizzard became the president of the Royal College of Surgeons um, many years later. But in the 1890s, James adopted a pseudonym of his own, Old Hubert, to press for social improvement, universal franchise for men, and annual parliaments, which could make the king subject to the law. Here's an example of one of old Hubert's uh, pamphlets, which I've chosen because of its focus on a street scene and a conversation between two men. Whilst the honest poor are wanting bread is an exclamation. Uh, whilst the honest poor are wanting bread, the energy with which these words were delivered excited my attention and led me to seek the person who had so feelingly uttered them. After some search, I perceived through the trees a man about 70 years of age and a young man who appeared to be his son sitting at the foot of the tree a few paces distance. Distress and want were strongly displayed on each of their countenances. We're happy to learn that the Princess of Wales is in perfect health, says the younger of the two, referring to the princess who will later become Queen Caroline. Well, poor creature, I'm glad to hear that, chips in the older man. She was supported in her way to the chapel in consequence of the weight of the ornaments and jewels being so excessive. The conversants turn out to be a father and son who are commenting on a newspaper report that the son is reading aloud and which the narrator, Old Hubert, overhears. Aye, poor young lady, the father responds. She's not been long enough in this country to know that thousands are sinking, not under the weight of jewels, but of want and despair she knows not that thousands in this country of the honest poor are at this moment wanting bread. The contrast with the measured and polite tones of his clinical writings could not be more stark, as we will see. Harvest failures over the summer of 1794 and prolonged drought with poor distribution practices had driven up bread prices and together with adulterations meant starvation was common. George III's reign was marked by a series of very expensive wars, including the Seven Years' War, the War of American Independence, and the military campaigns against revolutionary and Napoleonic France, which were mostly financed by regressive economic policies, resulting in hardship and food riots in almost every decade of that reign. The father of this sketch is one of the hungry which his son attempts to ameliorate by fetching handfuls of dandelions for him to eat, eliciting tears of paternal affection and gratitude." Unquote. Caricatures of the period played on starvation in the midst of plenty, indeed on raucous gluttony, as this etching entitled Substitutes for Bread, or Right Honourables Saving the Loaves and Dividing the Fishes, 1795. It shows cabinet ministers gorging themselves on platters of fish whose scales take the form of gold coins. A wall-mounted menu sets out suggested substitutes for bread, which include venison, roast beef and poultry, turtle soup and fish boiled in wine. Heaps of other bread substitutes on the table also take the form of coinage, together with a sign that reads, Gilray shows politicians quite literally eating the taxes of the populace, whilst our eyes are drawn to the view of the multitude through the window, which you can't really see from here. It's petitions and signboards reading, grant us the crumbs which drop from your table and proclaiming the presence of the starving swine. A reference to Edmund Burke's reflections on the revolution in France that had appeared in 1790 which argued that liberty and human rights were dangerous abstractions, and that whatever the demands of the populace, the swinish multitude, no change in constitutional arrangements should be granted. As well as sentiment, old Hubert, in his address to the Right Honourable Edmund Burke from the swinish multitude, dealt in sharp sarcasm, writing, quote, 
it must be acknowledged that your friends who have the management of our affairs avail themselves of every opportunity of molding us to your metaphor to render the resemblance between us and swine as great as possible. But as we bear the same countenance and forms as yourself, your associates and employers, we cannot but think we were created in the same scale of being with yourselves. We conclude that if ye are men, so are we. If we are swine, so are ye swine likewise. Let us then be all esteemed as swine together." Unquote. In the early 1790s, James joined the Freedom and Ease Masonic Lodge. Founded in the 1750s, and until then meeting in central London, including at the Strand, not far from here, its meetings uh, moved in 1790 to the Three Jolly Butchers in Hoxton. Attracted perhaps to its association with a radical artisan commitment to public works, Parkinson attended for a few years, and its book of meetings for this period are going to be on display. They're currently in that box on the table right here. Um, thanks to Susan Snell from the, uh, archive, the, from the archive of Freemasons Hall in Great Queen Street. Um, this has never been shown, I think, in public before, so um, we very much wanted to have it in the exhibition, but we just couldn't fit it in, as you will see when you go round. In the same period, in fact, pretty much simultaneous with him joining the Freemasons, he joined the Society for Constitutional Information, which had been created during the American War of Independence, which published political tracts promoting parliamentary reform and opposing the slave trade. Rarely more than 100 members strong, he soon joined the London Corresponding Society, which through correspondence worked in association with other such regional societies to promote reform. And in fact, the London Corresponding Society was extremely active in lobbying uh, members of parliament, lords, uh, various people in uh, um, positions of authority with their views about the importance of parliamentary reform. Predominantly artisan, its most populous occupations were shoemakers, weavers, mechanics, and tailors, including a handful of lawyers and doctors. At its height, it numbered three to 5,000 members and campaigned for annual parliaments, universal manhood suffrage, taxes graduated by wealth, and a greater say for ordinary people in how the country was run. Parkinson was active as a secretary to the group and wrote handbills and pamphlets urging reform. In 1794, he wrote a vindication of the London Corresponding Society. which exposed a campaign orchestrated against the society conducted by a government-backed Association for Preserving Liberty Against Republicans, which maintained that the corresponding society promoted violent insurrection. It put out information that assumed the guilt of several of the society's members just then under arrest and accused of high treason. The vindication started with a quote from the third Duke of Richmond, Field Marshal Charles Lennox, who had been a member of the Rockingham Whig government and briefly of Pitt's cabinet too, and for decades had argued in favor of American independence and parliamentary reform. When the people are fairly and equally represented in parliament, when they have annual opportunities of changing their deputies and through them of controlling every abuse of government in a safe, easy, and legal way, there can be no longer any reason for recurring to those ever dangerous, though sometimes necessary expedients of an armed force, which nothing but a bad government can justify." Unquote. The government reacted to the activism in favor of political reform by passing the Seditious Meetings and Treasons Act of 1795 requiring public meetings to have a magistrate's license and making discussion of reform a capital offence. The gagging acts, as Charles Fox, leader of the Whigs, called them, debarred free speech and outlawed not only organisations, but writing, lecturing, printing, and the selling of books and pamphlets discussing such matters. It suspended habeas corpus, rounded up and imprisoned hundreds of people, some for as long as three years without trial, and expanded the spying service on the domestic population. 
This is the context in which old Hubert identified with the downtrodden. In 1796, he volunteered to testify to a committee of the Privy Council, so he wasn't under trial, about an alleged conspiracy of treason known as the Popgun Plot. The government had claimed five members of the Corresponding Society, Parkinson not included, had planned to assassinate George III using an air gun loaded with a poison dart. He was interrogated by Pitt, the Prime Minister, and by the Attorney General, during which he admitted to being the author of the vindication and also to revolutions without bloodshed. And it's very interesting, actually, in his account of waiting to be interrogated by the Privy Council, he sees a member of, a former member of the London Corresponding Society called Upton, who was probably a spy for the government, who had actually um, uh, uh, plotted the, um, the, the pop gun plot. He had actually conspired to uh, frame a, a number of the um, members of the Corresponding Society. He sees Upton going in and out of various uh, doors in the Houses of Parliament. However, Parkinson held his ground in refusing to answer questions that might have appeared to incriminated him, uh, even after being warned by his interrogators that he actually stood before the highest court in the land. Revolutions without bloodshed uh, is um, the, uh, the, the, the corresponding society's response to some of this. Notice, without bloodshed. Um, and uh, it's um, typical. It's a very simple handbill. It's got a number of um, resolutions. It having been industriously asserted that the happiness and prosperity of the people would not be at all increased by a reform of the representation, it has been thought proper to publish the following enumeration of those changes, which in all probability might, thereby, might be thereby pro pro produced. One, the claims of the people might be more duly attended to and the rights restored. Two, taxes might be proportioned to the abilities of those on whom they are levied and not made to fall on the poor, more on the poor than on the rich. The present system of excising almost all the necessaries of life, such as soap, candles, starch, beer, etc., etc., might be abolished. And it ends, and this is a typical kind of flourish, it ends with um, a, an accusation that of the 513 members of parliament, 306 had actually been appointed by the treasury and by various forms of private patronage. And then you get this sort of traitors, traitors, traitors. So, um, and Parkinson's use, and particularly the Corresponding Society's use of typography in this period, is an interesting facet of this. All those accused of the popgun plot were eventually acquitted. But had the findings been otherwise, government agents would have plucked Parkinson from his practice, and the essay may never have been written. By the time the essay did appear in 1817, Parkinson was an accomplished author who had, in addition to his political works, published on gout, public health, madhouses, medical education, children's stories, fossils, and geological strata. He had been one of the founders of the Geological Society of London and was better known for his three-volume work, Organic Remains of a Former World, and for his extraordinary collection of fossils, reputed to be one of the largest and the best in Europe, than he was for his medical achievements. And just to give you a a, a, a taster of his interest in fossils. First of all, we have in the middle um, display cabinet some of the fossils from his original collection, which now belong to the uh, Natural History Museum, uh, which we're really thrilled about. Um, but the organic <laughs> remains of a former world, uh, the historian Martin Rudwick refers to it as the first comprehensive compilation of the fossils of England. It's a stupendous three-volume work. Each one cost about three guineas. This is the frontispiece for volume two, and that sponge there um, is actually in the cabinet, so you can see the relationship between the real object and its depiction. Many of the illustrations in these volumes were hand-colored by James's daughter, uh, Emma. Um, and this is volume two. Uh, uh, again, uh, um, some of the fossils, one of the fossils that we have in the display cabinet uh, comes from uh, some of the uh, plates 
Um, some of the plates come from it, rather. This is the sort of work that uh, we find in this. I mean, he's an experimenter. He's experimenting on these objects. He's trying to dissolve them. He's breaking them up. He's heating them. He's seeing what comes out of them. So it's very, very empirical in his approach. It's also rather like um, a sort of comparative anatomy. He's very interested in series of fossils. He's interested in the variation in shape, size, and form of what would be taken to be the same uh, species or genus. And um, there's also a very interesting issue around biblical chronology, because actually Parkinson, although he behaves very much like a nonconformist, uh, he is actually a member of the Church of England. He, beco he becomes an elder of St. Leonard's Church, Shoreditch, and very much in favor of Sunday school and uh, all sorts of re um, reform movements of that sort. And he's also one of the first people to um, worry a great deal about extinction uh, in that context, which he knows has happened. Uh, and also how to reconcile the geological, the growing cosmographic, co cosmo cosmogony, the, the account of the history of the earth, the geologically informed account with the biblical account. And one of the ways that he does it, he's not the first, but he's the first in English to do it, is to claim that each day of creation was an interminably long period of time. Whilst writing organic remains, Parkinson published an illustrated children's story entitled Dangerous Sports. This just gives you a sort of close-up. You get a sense of the way in which he's putting things in series. Much of it is narrated in the voice of a crippled man named Old Milson, who lives alone on the outskirts of a village. On a cold winter's night, Milson hears moans and groans coming from outside, and on investigating, finds a little boy weltering in blood, unquote, semi-conscious in the snow. Too disabled himself to pick him up, he drags the boy back to his house, where the warmth revives him. The boy tells Milson he's from a prosperous family and had been thrown from his horse when it bolted after children taunted the animal. It takes several days to tend to him back to tend him back to health, after which Milson reunites him with his family. And this is an image of the children taunting the horse, and this is the boy falling off, either his hat coming off separately, or in fact part of the taunting are the children throwing hats at the horse. It's not quite clear. The grateful boy George invites old Milson to his next birthday party. Milson, um, when, whom the narrator calls, quotes, benevolence on crutches, unquotes, turns out to be a cross between a mentor and a magician, entertaining the children uh, of the party to stories of a moral, sentimental, and gothic kind. During one telling, the party hears a loud groan, and the children jump up, jump up and crowd together. Well, well said Joe, trembling like an aspen leaf. It, it comes from the vault under the ruins of the old castle. Tis the devil. All eyes were fixed in dreadful suspense and alarm on the door when it flew open. And on Radcliffe, whose enchanting pages have so bewitched the public taste that every press now teems with mystery and horror. On Lewis, who hast fixed our admiration on bloodless bleeding ghosts and created mysteries not to be unraveled. The blame lies for this wonderful and terrific tale. For who now dare write, for who now will read, aught but what is filled with crashing and shrieking and bones and tombs and aerial beings? Why, my little reader, why in such a hurry? What did you hope to find there? Something shocking, sir. And why in such a hurry now? Because it is so shocking, sir. Then pray, my good fellow, what do you expect to come in at the door we've just opened? Why, a ghost, to be sure, sir. Well then, you shall not be disappointed. The door flew open, and whilst all eyes were fixed on the spot, I shiver whilst I write it, and not as you may think, from the cold and wind that blows in at the shattered window of my lofty garret. No, it is not from cold, it's sheer fright at my own writing, for I feel my hair standing on, up on end. Well, Mr. Author, don't talk about yourself so. Pray, go on. Well then, now for it. 
There follow stories of purpose that focus on the risks of fighting, playing with pen knives, taunting animals, climbing trees, warming oneself at the fire, entering rivers unable to swim, cautioning young readers of the dangers of such behavior and illustrated with simple primitivist wood engravings. The book was reprinted in the USA and the wisdom of old Milson still featured 10 years after Parkinson's death in formal manuals advising the public of the risks of accidents and how to avoid them. This is um, a young, uh, another wood engraving of a young woman who's caught fire by warming herself in front of the fire. And you can't see it very well in this light, but she's using a rug or a mat to smolder the fire. And um, in books that, there was a craze for books to try and uh, advise people of the, accident, of the risks and dangers of certain kinds of behaviors and accidents. And this particular one went into several editions uh, in the 1830s. And in 1834, it is referring to um, the advice of old Milson never to go into the water until you've learned to swim, referring here to the excellent little tale uh, by Mr. Parkinson. Well, let's get to what we're really meant to be talking about tonight, the essay on the shaking palsy, 1817, published um, in London. Um, I'll say a few words about the uh, structure. It's a short, as you will see when you see the, 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 the text, it's quite a slim volume. It's about 60 pages long, about 12,000 words. Um, it's divided into five chapters, and there won't be time to go into each chapter. So it starts with a definition, and it moves on to then what are called pathognomonic symptoms, <laughs> symptoms of the condition that are thought to be necessary, um, absolutely necessary for the diagnosis. And I'll come back to those terms in a minute. Um, then how you distinguish it from other forms of shaking, what the causes are, uh, and also actually the treatments, uh, with some more cases, and considerations concerning the means of cure. Um, Tremor coactive is actually an ancient term. Uh, it comes originally from Galen, and it refers to uh, an involuntary form of um, shaking. Uh, shaking that, um, uh, sh shaking of a particular sort, uh, often referred to as actually a palpitation. People talked about palpitation of the, of the limbs or trembling of the limbs uh, as much as they talked about uh, tremor, at least in English. And skeletor festinans is a, uh, a Byzantine term, it's a later term, for a particular kind of tottering gait. Uh, and these were terms that were used uh, in the medical literature uh, in the period. And when Parkinson uh, defines the condition, he says it's an involuntary tremulous motion with lessened voluntary power in parts, not in action, and even when supported with a propensity to bend the trunk forwards and to pass from a walking to a running pace, the senses and intellects being uninjured. And if you translate that into the two Latin terms that we were uh, talking about, this is really effectively what tremor coactus amounted to uh, in the late 18th century. And this is skeletor festinans. But the terms that are being used here and in uh, tremulous motion, lessened voluntary power in parts, not in action, and even when supported. Even when supported is the term that was used before we used to talk about tremor at rest. So people talk about a tremor, a tremor, a tremor at rest, whereas Parkinson would talk about a, a tremor that came on when your limb was supported. And actually hardly used the term tremor at rest. That's very much a modern rendering. He talked about agitations. Uh, tremblings and palpitations much more than he talked about tremor at rest. And that the senses and the intellects are uninjured is very important. It may seem like a small qualification, but it's actually a code for saying he doesn't think it's caused by the brain. Uh, he thinks it's caused by the spinal cord. Uh, but we'll come on to that. So I'll... Um, just spend a few minutes giving you a feeling for how he describes the condition. So slight and 
nearly imperceptible are the first inroads of this malady and so extremely slow its progress that it rarely happens that the patient can form any recollection of the precise period of its commencement. The first symptoms are a slight sense of weakness with a proneness to trembling in some particular part, sometimes in the head, but most commonly in one of the hands and arms. As the disease proceeds, the hand fails to answer with exactness to the dictates of the will. The legs are not raised to that height or promptitude which the will directs. Writing can now be hardly at all accomplished, whilst at meals the fork, not being duly directed, frequently fails to raise the morsel from the plate, which, when seized, is with much difficulty conveyed to the mouth. The fingers cannot be disposed of in the proposed directions and applied with certainty to any proposed point. Commencing in one arm, the wearisome agitation is born until beyond sufferance, when by suddenly changing the posture it's for a time stopped to commence generally in less than a minute in one of the legs. Harassed by this tormenting round, the patient has recourse to walking, a mode of exercise to which sufferers from this malady are in general partial. The power of conveying the food to the mouth is at length so much impeded that it is obliged to consent that he is obliged to consent to be fed by others. The bowels which had been all along torpid now in most cases demand stimulating medicines. The patient, unable any longer to support himself with his stick, dares not venture on exercise unless assisted by an attendant who, walking backwards before him, prevents his falling forwards by pressure of his hands against the forepart of his shoulders. As the malady proceeds, the propensity to lean forward becomes invincible and the patient is thereby forced to step on the toes and the forepart of the feet whilst the upper part of the body is thrown so far forward as to render it difficult to avoid falling. In some cases, the patient is irresistibly impelled to take much quicker and shorter steps and thereby to avoid unwillingly a running pace. He is not only no longer able to feed himself, but when the food is conveyed to the mouth, so much of the actions of the muscles of the tongue and pharynx impeded by impaired action and perpetual agitation, that the food is with difficulty retained in the mouth until masticated. The saliva fails of being directed to the back part of the fauces, and hence is continually draining from the mouth mixed with particles of food. As the debility increases, the tremulous agitation becomes so violent as to shake the bed hangings. The chin is now almost immovably bent down upon the sternum. The slops with which he has attempted to be fed with the saliva are continually trickling from the mouth. The power of articulation is lost. The urine and feces are passed involuntarily. And at the last, constant sleepiness with a slight delirium and other marks of extreme exhaustion announce the wished for release. The contrast between the indistinctness of the malady's onset and the distinctiveness of its subsequent features is drawn out in an account of great clarity and pathos. Within a trajectory of deterioration, Parkinson takes great care to delineate the sequence, pace, and severity of bodily changes. The succession of limb involvements, how tremor, weakness, and fatigue unfold spatiotemporally is visualized, not only through careful description of bodily effects, but existentially through the use of passive, ter passive turns of phrase evoking the march of a malady. The hand fails, the legs are not raised, the fork fails, the saliva fails, the chin is bent down, fingers cannot be disposed of in the proposed directions and applied with certainty. Submission of the limbs to the dictator of the will can hardly ever be accomplished or obtained. The patient is irresistibly impelled and obliged to, be cons to consent to be fed by others. Although the sufferer in the history is of a generic status, by focusing down on particulars, 
the smallest gestures of everyday life, as well as on attempts to adapt to bodily difficulties of standing, sitting and walking, on frustrations and impulsions. By, this, by these means, the abstract sufferer convincingly attains a sense of presence. Some modes of 18th century science intermingled sensibility and empiricism in ways that acknowledged that acknowledged a sort of felt responsiveness on the part of scientists towards their objects of inquiry. A responsiveness which generated observations not from sensory experience alone, but from a combination of sensation, sentiment, and a certain amount of identification with and imagination about the object of interest. Parkinson's way of looking, I believe, was not that of a spectator disconnected from the objects of his interest or subordinated to the taxonomic and voyeuristic drives of what Walter Benjamin would later characterize in a different context as botanizing on asphalt, but rooted in urban practice. Take the fifth case um, in, the, in, the, in the case series which follows the history the, lament the lamentable subject of which was seen only at a distance, immobile and unable to move, supported by his attendant, who, standing before him with a hand on each shoulder, until by gently swaying backward and forward, the patient had placed himself in equipoise, when, giving the word, he would start, that is, the, sir, the attendant would start in a running pace, sliding from before him and running forward, being ready to receive him and prevent his falling. The deafness with which the scene is encapsulated, the pair rocking cooperatively to and fro until the man presumably was at 45 degrees and would fall forwards is very striking. The sixth case Parkinson introduced as one which presented itself to observation since those above mentioned, unquote, implying he was observed with the benefit of hindsight gained from the earlier cases. Textually much longer, this case charts a sequence of symptoms in a man over a 12-year period. The effects of the malady on the sufferer's life are contextualized with the patient's views about its vexations and causation. His bowels, we learn, were much retarded, a problem Parkinson thought common to many sufferers and he noticed the man's trembling temporarily disappeared following a stroke, only to return again as one side bodily, of one -sided, as one -sided bodily paralysis resolved. Parkinson twice noticed the sufferer's capacity to suspend the agitations by an act of will. At present, he is almost constantly troubled with the agitation when, by a sudden and somewhat violent change of posture, he almost always is able to stop it. And he, being then just come in from a walk, with every limb shaking, threw himself rather violently into a chair and said, now I'm as well as ever I was in my life. The shaking completely stopped, but returned within two minutes. The scene portrays not only the man's ingenuity and attempts to exert agency, but also a note of triumph in being able to demonstrate this self-discovered method of stopping the shaking, albeit transiently. As case six reaches its close, another voice is heard, that of the patient's wife. It being asked if walking, he felt much apprehension from the difficulty of raising his feet if he saw a rising pebble in the path, he avowed in a strong manner his alarm on such occasions. And it was observed by his wife that she believed that in walking across the room, he would consider as difficulty for having to step over a pin. Parkinson's conversation and interviewing was not only able to call, for, call forth informative responses from patient and carer in confirming the patient's fear of falling, apprehension at the prospect of stepping over small objects, a rising pebble in the path, Parkinson brings to the fore the man's psychological as well as physical vulnerability. The respectful relationship among, the pres among those present is apparent. The report accommodates several viewpoints, the doctor's keen understanding and desire to learn more, 
the patient's subjective experience and vulnerability and the wife's insightful observation of her husband's condition. The essay developed an unprecedentedly rich and detailed picture of how certain disorders of shaking, posture and gait, previously thought to be separate, belonged, as Parkinson put it, to the same species of disease. The novelty of his formulation lay in interlocking hitherto known dismobilities into a new compound clinical ensemble with a long trajectory which is compactly recounted in a narrative. Although he insisted on using the vernacular English name for the malady, it was Parkinson who invented the term paralysis agitans, which conferred a new sense of rea reality on it with a new referent offering new possibilities for placing it within disease classifications. Unfortunately, the term gave rise to many disputes, the turns and twists of which are traced in the exhibition. So to conclude, the author of the essay commanded a wide range of written repertoires and communicative registers, not all of which it's been possible to explore in this talk. In his scientific writings, Parkinson could equally well adopt a third-person perspective and a highly descriptive style as conversational and epistolary registers. In his children's stories, he deployed techniques from Gothic and sentimental fiction in racy and echoey forms of narration that work not only as self-contained modes of aesthetic entertainment, but as interventions in social and child rearing practices that develop what today we might call teachable moments for a, te for a teenage audience. He was a socially engaged apothecary surgeon steeped in the print culture of his day. In advice manuals and educational admonitions addressed to the public, he used novelistic techniques discernible too in his political writings, which give full rein to his solidarity with the poor and the powerless. He seems to have had a creative and fluent mind and was, a deter and was determined to improve the lot of the disadvantaged, whether arising from disease or from being downtrodden. Kings has rich holdings of his works because he joined the Guy's Physical Society as an honorary member in 1786. This was the first medical society in London, founded in 1771, and it met weekly to talk about cases and medical matters of the day. It built up an impressive library as many of its members donated their publications to the society whose library is now housed here in special collections. And of course, these have been augmented by loans from uh, libraries and museums across London, but also in Cambridge and in Paris, and tonight from the Freemasons uh, archive too. The layout here is roughly chronological as follows. So the first two cases, it moves from left to right. The first two cases cover Parkinson's education, his professional formation, and his interests in um, medical education and public education. The cases three and four are about his locality in Hoxton Square, Kingsland Road, and Whitechapel, and his political activities of the 1790s. Case five in the middle um, is the geology, which shows the fossils from his own collection on loan from the Natural History Museum, uh, two from the organic remains and a spectacular ammonite whose genus is now called Parkinsonia. It's very unusual to have a whole genus of, species, of, of fossils to be named after you. And Parkinson also has a, 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 a zone, a, a geological zone, I think it's a sediment zone, called uh, Zona Parkinsonia, I know, named after him. Um, important 17th and 18th century precursor texts to the essay and to his consideration are in case six, and in case seven and eight, the essay itself, a first edition, and its afterlife in the works of Trousseau, Charcot, and Gowers. And in the final case, case nine, which completes the exhibition, the essay's legacy in the 20th century, including texts that addressed an audience beyond, but not excluding the medical. So please have a look at the exhibition at your leisure, and then we can amble down for drinks whenever it suits you. Thank you very much.
If anybody's got any questions or comments or concerns, please. Yes. Uh, I think it's sort of both. Um, he practiced as an apothecary all his life from Hoxton Square until about, very soon after the essay was published, probably till about 1818, 1819. So he was a, a practitioner. Um, he practiced first of all with his father and then with his son. And both he and his father and he and his son published papers together. And that wasn't necessarily that unusual for apothecaries. So that he, so his clinical work continued throughout his life, that's the first thing. Um, it is thought that he attended John Hunter's lectures um, in the 1780s, is it? Or 1770s? 1780s, he attends John Hunter's lectures after he's qualified uh, in his premises in Leicester Square. And in fact, um, the very first record of his interest in shaking disorders is from the period when he um, notices a patient that John Hunter is presenting who's got what he calls a universal palsy, so she's shaking all over. Um, but he's also interested in John Hunter's fossils, which he sees at that time. And probably he becomes interested in fossils soon uh, after that period, although it's not absolutely clear. Um, so his political work is definitely gaining pace in the 1780s and 90s. His work in the corresponding society and all the radical publications, probably about 20 in all, a lot of them in the British Library, um, are in the 1790s. And they tail off really at the end of the 1790s, possibly because of the pop gun plot, possibly because of all the treason acts, possibly because of his own interrogation. He appears in various trials at the Old Bailey as character witnesses for these uh, accused, including John Thelwell, but others as well, who are all acquitted of the charges. And it's really at the end of the 1790s that he turns towards medical education for medical students and public education about medicine for the wider populace, and also uh, collecting fossils. He has massive correspondence all over the world collecting fossils. A lot of people have accused him of actually, he has a, his geological um, texts are actually epistolary. Uh, they consist of letters. And the letters are very sort of personal to begin with. So he describes going out of London in his horse and chase with his daughter and with another interlocutor who isn't called Old Milson. He's called Old Wilton, who keeps, uh, keeps asking questions about, you know, what you're seeing and what's this and what's that. And Parkinson's um, trying to answer and the daughter's chipping in. Uh, but also they get out and they stop and they say to you, you know, why are you collecting these stones? And, collecting all sorts of stories. A lot of people say this is all fiction. He doesn't do any of this. He was far too busy in Hoxton Square. I don't think so. I think when you read that text, which of course is huge, um, cer certain kinds of um, phraseology and his approach to the objects and the landscape seem to me to come from um, a very sort of similarly literate, lively eye of an observer who was actually there. So his well, his interest in fossils really goes on from the late 1790s right to the very end of his life. His very last public publication uh, called um, A Study of Orictology, A Study of Fossils, again another huge volume, is in the 1820s. So a lot of these things are taking place simultaneously. There is a bit of, you know, there's a bit of evolution, there's a bit of overlap, but a lot of it's just going on all the time. I mean, extraordinary energy. It's just extraordinary how he could possibly have held it together. And he's publishing case reports um, at the same time, often quoting from the uh, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, incredibly well read, has read Cuvier, um, uh, Lamarck, has read all the major natural historians, uh, is quoting Boerhaave and others in the original Latin, is translating them. It's entirely homeschooled. I mean, we don't know where he was educated, certainly didn't go to university. Um, so that's the sort of picture one gets from him, of him. Yes. Yeah. 
No, he wasn't just a scientist at all. I don't think he thought himself as a scientist. He was interested in science, no question about it. He's very concerned about the treatment. Um, in fact, it, it, one of the things he says at the very beginning is that I'm probably publishing this essay a bit prematurely because I, don't, I can't be sure of the cause and I can't be sure of the treatment. And those are the things that really, really matter to him. And the reason he says he publishes the essay is because he thinks it's going to stimulate more research into precisely those two aspects, the cause and the treatment. The cause he works out as being in the spinal medulla, the very top of the cervical part of the spinal cord and what's called the medulla oblongata. He works it out in an incredibly interesting way and it's in the second half of the essay and there wasn't really time to go into it. But he works out that because of the way in which, the, it's the way in which the pattern of the, of the disorder of how it comes on and how it evolves. He also thinks that there is a long prodrome, that's to say he believes that um, pain is one of the very earliest symptoms of this condition. Uh, which took about 100 years, to 150 years, to gain much credence. It's really only post-Second World War that this has become uh, more apparent. So he understands that you get pain in the brachial area of the arm before it starts to shake. And um, the distribution of weakness and loss of power also locates it to the upper part of the spinal cord. He, then, he therefore treats it through leeches, blisters, and uh, vesicatories, things that cause blistering, and opening up issues, opening up channels in the neck in order to uh, let the blood out, but also to let the inflammation out. He believes that if you catch the condition very early on, you can actually stop it progressing, and you can cure it. But he's only got a, he's only got a few cases and he knows that that's not adequate. So he's very concerned about treatment. He's very, very um, uh, therapeutically orientated. Mm. Well, yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, he, he's very exercised about the flood. And one reason is because, um, first of all, he believes in extinction, so, um, so, so there's that. But one of the things that worries him a great deal is that at this period, that no human fossils have been found. So, um, He's very concerned that um, there's no evidence prior to the flood, no geological evidence prior to the flood of us. Um, and that's a terrible problem for him and he has no answer for it. Uh, he does believe that the flood was a, was a, a God-made event. Um, and in fact, volume one of Organic Remains starts off with um, a beautiful view through a sort of craggy opening at a beach with some fossils on the, on the beach and a boat in the distance and over the boat there's a rainbow. And that's the first frontispiece to volume one of Organic Remains. So it has a very strong biblical framing. I don't think he actually goes into, I don't think he enters into the debate about how geologically um, the earth was formed, but he definitely believes in the flood and definitely believes that the flood was a God-made event. But of course, everything has to have uh, a natural hist historical explanation too. So he also believes, obviously, in Paley's um, sense of design within nature. 
and the 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 the, the what you know a thing that looks like a watch must have a watchmaker that sort of approach so a thing that looks like a flood has to have a has to have a divine cause as far as he's concerned he's sure the flood happened he knows that the fossils that we're finding um, in northern climes uh, are also in southern climes so you know he's also aware that there are continuities of geological strata he's the first person uh, to show that the strata in northern France are almost par almost exactly the same as those in southern England um, and that's a very important so there's also an issue around how did England become a, Britain become an island so he's very concerned with all those things he's very um, keen to promote the importance of fossils as a way of dating strata and showing that strata that don't link up and they're in different positions um, are, were once continuous because they have the same fossil composition. So he's got all those kinds of um, uh, conceptual tools at his disposal. No, definitely not. Definitely not. No, no. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. Definitely not. But that's that's the nature of the way in which historical reputations wax and wane and change. I mean, let me give you an example of this. So, first of all, he's very apologetic about publishing the essay. He implies it's 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 premature publication, and it's only because he sees how severe this condition is that he believes it's justified. Because he says his 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 publication is full is full of spe of a f particular form of speculation by speculation he doesn't mean just throwing things out randomly he means he hasn't got the anatomico pathological evidence he also brings in other people's published cases in great detail trying to work out what the pathological cause is but no the essay definitely isn't is a minor publication for james parkinson and i'll tell you give you some strong evidence for why First of all, in uh, the 1820s, he is the first recipient of the honorary gold medal of the Royal College of Surgeons. This is an extraordinary achievement. The, the, the medal had been struck at the very end of the, um, of the 18th century, just before the college was formed. And they spent 20 years looking for a first recipient. Um, and Parkinson was, you know, not a university educated person he was an apothecary he wasn't uh, he wasn't a practicing consulting surgeon in that sense of the term in which for example blizzard uh, or his teachers at the london hospital were he wasn't a hospital based uh, um, physician or surgeon um, and the citation for that gold medal is a wonderful um, other talk, but it's essentially saying um, that you know we're we're a liberal-minded, pluralistic college. We believe in natural history. We believe in the importance of scientific information. And what we're doing in honouring James Parkinson is praising him for his fossil collection, for it. It, the, the largesse with which he allows people to visit and replies to correspondence about it. So for, he gets the, the honorary gold medal of the Royal College of Surgeons. It has nothing to do with the essay. So that's one bit of evidence. The second bit of evidence is that in, uh, two, is, is in 1911, I think it's the 11th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, there's a very s small entry about James Parkinson. It just says, um, James Parkinson, an English paleontologist who was also a medical practitioner who, um, who wrote Organic Remains of a Former World. Um, so although it caused a great deal of interest in medical circles, it didn't really, the, the essay didn't really break out of this r rather narrow range of 19th century medical preoccupation. That preoccupation is very interesting itself because 
huge amounts of disputes and um, uh, controversies around, you know, what is this condition? What's in it? What's outside it? What's its cause? Right the way to the end of the 19th century, people like Trousseau, people like Charcot, people like Gowers believe very strongly that um, although it's an organic condition, it also has a very strong kind of uh, neurotic, traumatic um, um, origin, so shock. The shock of hearing about the death of a child or hearing artillery fire uh, might bring it on. And that's partly connected with this idea that uh, psychological trauma ca ca causes us to shake. Uh, and a lot of the shaking on the streets of London in the 19th century were people who were being attacked or they were being accused of theft or something uh, and they start to shake and this is very well shown in, 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 in lots of texts. Um, but also um, the, there's, a, there's a lot of dispute about, um, uh, first of all, has it really got, is there, is there really true paralysis in paralysis agitans? And a lot of people said, well, no, there isn't. It's a silly name. But actually, it wasn't a silly name because um, the funny thing is, it was a transliteration of Parkinson's into Latin of the word palsy. And there was um, basically no Latin. The word palsy comes down in a different route. And so he knew there was no there was no Latin for palsy, so he wanted a Latinate name. And on the other hand, he also wanted um, something to reflect agitation and shaking, so he called it paralysis agitants. Well, lots of people said, well, there's no true paralysis, and that, so that's wrong. And other people, people particularly like Charcot, said, we found cases of this without any shaking, so both paralysis and agitants, they're both wrong. And also, he didn't see rigidity, and he didn't see this, and he didn't see that. And this goes on throughout the whole of the 19th century. Um, people are then saying, uh, Sanders in particular, this Edinburgh physician, sees that the variety of shaking disorders are all being called paralysis agitans, and that's not right. You can see it's not right. Uh, he doesn't like the shaking palsy because that's too kind of vernacular. So he calls it Parkinson's disease or um, paralysis agitans Parkinsoniae. And Charcot actually reads Sanders' work um, and calls it La Maladie de Parkinson without, without giving Sanders any credit. Um, no one in England likes, La, um, likes Parkinson's disease. They don't like it. There's a huge um, resistance to it, partly because Gowers is attached to paralysis adjutants, and he has the largest case series probably in the world, over 80 cases in his Manual of Nervous Diseases incredibly detailed. And then many of the British neurologists at Queen Square and elsewhere don't like eponyms, they resist it. But the French absolutely insist on La Maladie de Parkinson. This goes on throughout the whole of the first half of the 20th century. But still the majority of papers published in um, the post-war era in the medical press call it paralysis agitans or um, La Maladie de Parkinson. They don't call it Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease in English only appears really in the mid-1970s. And it's the, it's the arrival of L-DOPA, really, that, that does it. It's not Charcot. There's a huge resistance. And the resistance in, in Britain is quite interesting. It isn't anti-La Maladie de Parkinson. It's actually anti-eponym. Because people argued that it's ridiculous to call diseases by names that mean nothing. Um, there's a very interesting article um, by Walsh, who's a very interesting neurologist, who argues that in the, there's one exception to this case, which is Parkinson's disease. And the reason why is a very interesting reason. And that is, he says, the advantage of Parkinson's disease is that it, it's such a complicated disorder. It's so protein and it's so um, variable. Uh, that the only way that it makes sense to refer to it is by a, a name that forces you to read the literature in detail. <laughs> Which I think is a very, very good reason for calling it something. Um, so the eponym, you know, one thinks there's lots of neurologists who've said, oh, he's the most famous neurologist in the world. But I don't really think he was a neurologist in the neurological ter sense of that term. And it's very much neurologists looking for... Re reinventing their, their tradition and looking for precursors of their own sense of self. Um, Parkinson 
didn't have any idea of what a neurologist would be. The term hadn't been invented before he died, or perhaps, no, it hadn't been invented. I think it was first used by Cook in, in the 1820s. Neurology was in use by Willis, but neurologist is rather like science and scientist. Neurologist comes much later. Um, but certainly by the mid to late 19th century, it is a term that's being used, and people are looking back for their ancestors, and Parkinson turns out to be one of them. So, thank you very much. Please have a look at the, um, at the exhibition, and please have a drink downstairs sometime. Thank you.